Hello, everyone. Welcome to Court with Chrissy. What's good? The sentencing with Judge Mogan. What's bad? Drugs, cartels, and changing your story at the 11th hour. I hope you like it. Court with Chrissy is now in session. We will go on the record in the matters 24 CF 55, 24 CF 167, State of Wisconsin versus Vanessa DeCora. The state appears through Assistant District Attorney Kevin Schmidt in person. Ms. DeCora appears in person with Counsel Gabriel Pollock. We're set here today in these cases for two things. One is a sentencing hearing in 24 CF 55. We had a jury trial, a speedy jury trial in on July 23rd, 2024, in which Ms. DeCora was found guilty on all counts, counts one through seven, possession with intent, amphetamine, methamphetamine greater than 10, but less than 50 grams, one count of possession of narcotic drugs, one count of possession of THC, one count of operating while revoked, one count of possession of drug paraphernalia, and two counts of felony bail jumping. We are also here for an initial appearance in 24 CF 167. Mr. Schmidt, what is happening in the, that case? Is that proceeding? Oh, the, the bail jump. We had an agreement to read that into today. All right. So you're asking that the court dismiss and read in 24 CF 167 as part of a global resolution. Is that correct, Mr. Pollock? Yes, Your Honor. All right. The court will dismiss and read in 24 CF 167. As to the sentencing in 24 CF 55, the court did not order a pre-sentence investigation report because Ms. DeCora had a very a slim criminal history. Mr. Schmidt, argument and sentencing recommendation, please. Sure, Judge. Uh, I'm going to start out by briefly going over uh, the criminal history and the adjustment and supervision. Um, as the court indicated, Ms. DeCora has nine prior criminal convictions, all of which were in Sawyer County. None of the convictions were drug related. Uh, it breaks down to two disorderly conducts, a felony criminal damage to property, an OWI2, a misdemeanor bail jump, and four convictions for obstruction. Uh, the history goes back to 2004, so it goes back quite a few years. And uh, the last conviction was 2019, when she that year she was convicted of obstruction and bail jumping, misdemeanor bail jumping. She has been to prison before on that criminal history, though. Uh, the felony crime damage to property was a probation case with a state imposed prison sentence of one and a half in, two out. She did get revoked on that and went to prison in 2013. So she was on supervision for about three years during that period prior to getting revoked. So she has had one period of time in which she's been on probation. The outcomes of every other case has been either a fine or time served jail sentence from credit built up over the course of the case. When this offense occurred, uh, Ms. DeCora was on bond for possession of narcotic drugs out of Sawyer County. Uh, she was placed on bond there on January 17th of this year. This offense happened on March 1st, so about a month and a half later. Sawyer has this uh, Justice Point pretrial supervision program that she was supposed to be supervised on. I don't know the current specifics of it, but I do know from reading about it on CCAP notes, uh, it, it has some sort of like drug testing monitoring component to it. I'm sure Attorney Pollock knows way more about it, and he'll give the court information if it needs it. Um, this supervision, this bond did not control her behavior because while out on bond, she had this violation that amounted to this case. Uh, basically, she was found in our county with uh, Roland Peterson uh, in a van coming through our county from the cities to here. Uh, the read in bail jump is almost exactly the same thing. The bail jump is a violation of the no contact provision. Uh, once again, in our county, just passing through. Roland Peterson, the same van. Uh, this time there was no drugs on Mr. Peterson or on Ms. DeCora. However, she did, they did have her daughter with them, Tiana Wade, who had drug paraphernalia on her. 
Um, she has an ongoing case now in our county now for drug paraphernalia. And she uh, was having a medical emergency at the time. So when the defendant was in our jail, she tried to help herself to get out on her own, our jail for this case. She called up an officer and tried to convince them that she's innocent, that generally she complained about her bond being too high. She tried to convince the officer to help her to get out or get consideration. A big part of the state's argument to the jury was about how calculating and self-interested uh, Vanessa DeCora was in those interactions. That's why, do, why we played the whole video of the interview to show the self-interest. She ratcheted up her efforts each time she was rebuffed by Deputy Mangan. Uh, officer, I'm innocent, but I'm cooperating, so maybe that'll help. Officer, my bond is unfair. It's disproportionate. Why, again, the Sawyer County, can you help? Officer, I can get you a bigger fish in the cities. Can you help? Or Sawyer County. That was the broad strokes of the interview. Uh, the court saw it at trial. Uh, I'm going to break apart the pertinent facts of this case and what was shown to the jury as it relates specifically to the sentencing today. So Vanessa DeCore is from Sawyer County. All of her convictions going back 20 years are Sawyer County. She really has no connection here. The explanation she gave to the police is that she was going to the cities to visit her daughter and then come back. Burnett's just the place in between the places she actually wants to go. Uh, Roland Peterson said something corroborating that. Uh, I think that was heard on the body cam video. Uh, though he implied that Vanessa's daughter was somehow related to the drugs in some manner that was never explained. In her interview with Bailey, Vanessa indicated she had grown up at some point in the cities or lived there for some time as she talked about knowing locations there from when she was younger or familiarity with it. Anyways, the vehicle was stopped with Vanessa driving. It's Roland's vehicle. Roland is there. He's higher than a kite. Vanessa is stone cold, rock solid. She's literally sitting on drugs and paraphernalia in the vehicle. There's tinfoil all over the vehicle. In the back of the vehicle, there's that hatch compartment container cont containing a roll of tinfoil that all the small bits obviously came from with the way it was cut, as well as the large quantity of drugs. In her interview with Bailey Mangan, she acted entirely out of self-preservation. She said, I'm totally innocent of the drugs in the vehicle. She overvouched to the point of incredulity when she said, I would have never gotten in the car if I knew there were drugs. Well, in the same interview saying, I'm actively using drugs, I'm addicted to drugs. Uh, she was just saying whatever she thought in that in moment in her time with Bailey from moment to moment during the course of the interview that would benefit her. She then told a story that deeply concerns me. She talked about her connections in the cities. The gist of her story is that she has this drug dealer in Sawyer County named Jay Potak. At some point or multiple points, she's gone with Jay to the cities. He has cartel connections. He helped her get those connections and he sells in Sawyer County. At some point, she got close enough to the cartel by sitting with those guys, as she phrased it in the interview, that she can go there on her own. She talked about how she could get large quantities of drugs. She told Bailey she's done so in the past. She said she independently made her own connection with an Asian cartel, though they didn't probe that too much. She denied selling drugs, but said she would trade drugs for items, uh, which is concerning because one, that's still delivery of controlled substances. And two, I think it stretches credibility a bit when she's talking about what she's doing. I have cartel connections and I can get up to, you know, thousand dollars worth of drugs and come back to Sawyer, but I never sell it is it stretches cred credibility. After doing this interview with Deputy Mangan, she sought consideration from the state. State made an offer, didn't give enough consideration, so went to trial. The jury verdict was the determination of fact. Uh, the jury found that the claim of total innocence of the car, you know, I would never get in a car that had drugs in it, despite being a drug user, they found that unpersuasive. They found, I didn't know about the drugs and pipe I was sitting on, to be unpersuasive. They found the detailed explanation and the cartel connections and giving specific names and locations to be persuasive. They looked at what she lied about and what she didn't and saw a person acting in a manner consistent with the allegations against her and found her guilty. A person acting with cold, deliberate, 
self-preservation. So here's where I am now. Gravity of the offense, one of the first of the three of the McCleary factors. This is a person with cartel connections. That was the evidence at trial. That's what she said to the officer. She made those through her dealer with the Mexican cartel, according to the interview. And then she made her own independent connections with an Asian cartel sitting with those guys. She lives in Sawyer County. And her only reason being here was travel. Presumably she also traveled through Washburn County because I don't know how else you get that trajectory there in between here and Sawyer County to go buy drugs and then drive them back to Sawyer County, passing through these two counties. She is the link in the chain or one of them between the cartel in Mexico, the Twin Cities and Sawyer County. She's not the pipeline, she's not the fire hose, but she is a spigot. That's high gravity. It's rare among our drug dealing crimes we see in Burnett County, we find somebody with this close a connection to the cartel. We're aware that's where a lot of the drugs come from because they have the labs in Mexico, they can make the meth, it's easy to get it over the border. It comes through the pipeline in the cities. Police frequently track the trend back to the cities vaguely, but this close is rare. Usually we're several more links in the chain away. In the federal sentencing guidelines, having any connection of the offense to an organization or gang that is known to use violence is an aggravating factor. By helping that organization at all, even if you didn't do violence, uh, enables their style and methods. There are so many people in the United States and Mexico murdered every year by the cartels. The Council for Foreign Relations estimates about 30,000 people get killed in Mexico each year since 2018. Nine of the 10 highest per capita murder rates among cities are in Mexico. Vanessa knows how dangerous these people are that she's dealing with, that she's buying from, that benefit from her as much as she benefits from them. She warned Deputy Mangan in that footage of how dangerous they were. Don't go there on your own. They're heavily armed. I can get in. They trust me. Her source of her contraband is highly aggravating is what I'm getting at. The driving while revoked, the possession of THC, the possession of fentanyl, and the larger scheme of things uh, are, are of such less gravity compared to the possession with intent. If those were all she was convicted of those offenses, we'd probably be talking conditional jail and probation. Uh, the two felony bail jumpings are more concerning. Uh, With the volume of offenses, there could have been more bail jumps stacked. There could have been, you know, one new crime for each count if we really wanted to, and it could have been a flooded complaint with bail jumps. We didn't do that. We did two bail jumps. I think these bail jumps are more aggravated than other bail jumps we see because of one, the gravity of the offense, and two, uh, the connection between the offense and what she was on bond for. She was on bond in Sawyer County with the possession of narcotic drugs, drug-related and then the violation is a possession with intent to deliver of drugs. So in the same category as drugs, what you're on bond for, about a month and a half after you're placed on that bond, and it's a higher violation than what you're on bond for. I think those things make the felony bail jumps aggravating. Here's the part where I want to transition to talking about protection of the public, which is obviously related to gravity of the offense. My biggest concern with this whole case isn't even Vanessa DeCora dealing drugs. That's number two for me. Don't get me wrong. That's an extremely big problem. My number one concern here is all the people that she is and could be roping into this, expanding the conspiracy, because she wasn't just alone. Uh, let's go back to how Vanessa described getting her connections. She has a drug dealer in Sawyer County. This drug dealer has cartel connections. She somehow builds her relationship with him strong enough that he's taking her to the cities. She's, he's introducing her to people. She's building those connections on her own. She's built up and trusted enough. She's telling police she can go there on her own now. She can do those things on her own. In fact, she says she has. What that means is she could take somebody like Roland Peterson or a relative like her daughter, Tiana Wade, to the cities and expand those relationships to build those connections. My concern with her is she obviously has no interest in Burnett County. She's from Sawyer County. She's just passing through. But what about the next person she brings in? 
the next that person she takes to the Twin Cities and this connection, the same as Jay Potak took her. That sort of knowledge and connections to this source of drugs is extremely dangerous to the public. It creates a real strong possibility of expanding this behavior into other people and to other places. I think that society needs to be protected, not just from, you know, the convicted behavior, possessing with intent to deliver drug dealing, but from somebody who has this, these connections and can do things like introduce people to, to these cartel connections in the cities. This finally brings us to character of the offender, the third McCleary Galleon factor. Our criminal history is not good, but it's not bad. It's nine convictions over 20 years, which is less than we see from a lot of other people. But if you talk to average Joe on the street, it's still probably say nine convictions is a lot. So it's somewhere in the middle. More than half of the convictions are for defying courts or police, you know, bail jump or obstruction. The only time she's been on probation, she had a state imposed prison sentence and got revoked. So she only time been on probation, didn't do it with something heavy over her head. What I'm leading into there is, what we know for the sentence for this is one, probation is not appropriate. Uh, two primary reasons. One, it depreciates the seriousness of the offense. Selling drugs floods our community with poison. It has a lot of collateral consequences that causes people to become unproductive, lose their jobs. Create, that creates more crime itself as they do property crimes like theft and burglary and things of that nature. It's a spillover offense. It's a social enemy offense. Two, um, I'm sure she needs treatment she, with her connections and her history of bail jumping and obstruction. She can't be treated safely in the community. The only time she's done probation, she didn't succeed. She had prison over her head for that and it was insufficient. I don't think she can be trusted because she didn't follow her bond multiple times, both from the criminal conviction, from the read and bail jump, from the bail jump convictions. She lied to... Uh, Deputy Mangan about her claims of innocence. Uh, and she ha it's not realistic to think she'd succeed on probation and with the gravity of offense and her connections, it's too risky to even try. I think this is clearly a prison case. I think it's rare when we have a possession with intent case that isn't a prison case just off of gravity of offense and protection of the public. And this is not one of those exceptional cases. I think there are a number of aggravating factors, the main ones being the cartel connections. And even though she doesn't have prior convictions, the court saw that interview where she talked about having gone to the cities and buy these large quantities of drugs before, bringing in other people. So how long? How long would be an appropriate prison sentence in this case? The most serious conviction is the D felony, possession of intent to deliver fel uh, methamphetamine, that's uh, between 10 and 50 grams. The actual amount here was about 15 grams. If you add like the one big packet with the two smaller ones, the legislature thinks the worst, most aggravated case of possession of intent to deliver and the worst, most awful offender for this offense would be 15 years initial confinement, 10 years extended supervision, because that's the max. Uh, all the other offenses, the OAR, the THC, the paraphernalia, the fentanyl, the two felony bail jumps, they happen at the same time. They're part of the same course of conduct. I view those more as aggravating the possession with intent as opposed to something to deal with on their own independently with this offense. When I look at the possessions, I don't really see those as particularly aggravating or mitigating with this, this conviction because they tell us something we already know. She, she's addicted to drugs. Merely being addicted to drugs is not in and of itself a reason to send someone to prison. They kind of just reflect the drug use. Uh, the OAR is somewhat aggravating on the D felony because it sure looks like her lack of ability to drive is why she roped in Roland Peterson and brought in someone else to drive her. And then just for silly reasons, she went and drove anyways, even though it wasn't even her car. The felony bail jumps, I think, are highly aggravating towards it, given how soon this happened to being placed on bond that month and a half. And the fact it's it's related, it's a drug offense she's on bond for, and then it's a worse drug offense she's convicted of. 
the amount of meth I'd say is not aggravating. Um, because of this amount of meth, it puts you on the low end of that 10 to 50 scale. So we would expect someone who had closer to the 50 to be considered more aggravating than Vanessa Decora, who's closer to the 10. The, uh, her lack of previous convictions for dealing is also not aggravating for her, but that kind of has an asterisk because of her talking to Deputy Mangan and talking about going there, buying large quantities, coming back, trading, I don't sell. The self-serving nature of her interview is aggravating. Uh, this is a case where the defendant comes to the court on a serious offense without the benefit that a lot of people have where they can say, hey, I pled guilty. That's acceptance of responsibility. Acceptance of responsibility is an accepted factor for mitigation. She doesn't have that. And in fact, we have the interview with Deputy Mangan where you really see her doing that self-serving behavior that spin out one lie here, spin out one lie there, mix this, mix in a bit of truth the self-serving behavior I've referred to a couple times. Uh, to one extent, she did cooperate with police a little bit. That's one of the secondary factors that a court can consider for sentencing uh, in that she talked about these cartel connections. She was trying to help herself out. I think really the fact with the way that went and her not getting Deputy Mangan to say what she wanted, I'm getting you out to get you to work, not getting the outcome she wanted, I think really explains what her actual animus was, what her actual goal was. The cooperation was, again, self-serving. When it didn't seem it would help, she didn't, wasn't interested anymore. Uh, one of the things BCSO did when getting the information from Ms. DeCora, as they called Sawyer County, said who she was and what she was offering. And they said no, because they didn't think they could work with her. I think that makes sense given her convictions for obstruction. The single most aggravating factor, the red flag is the cartel connections I've already talked to a couple times. It's rare to see that in a case. The court knows that. So to that end, I would ask the court to sentence Vanessa DeCora in this manner. On the D felony possession with intent to deliver, I would ask the court to sentence Decora to 10 years initial confinement, five years extended supervision. That sentence would encompass 60% of the max, uh, using two thirds of the max confinement time, 10 out of 15, and half the max extended supervision time, five out of 10. I think that Decora is statutorily ineligible for CIP because of her age. I would ask the court to make her not eligible to obtain the benefits of ERP until serving at least six years of her initial confinement period. Again, I'm picking that like 60% period. I think for conditions of extended supervision, the court should at, do no drugs, no paraphernalia, absolute sobriety, no contact with any known drug users or drug dealers, no contact with Roland Peterson, no contact with Jay Potak. I think the court should order no contact with Burnett County. She has no connection to here. She has no reason to be here. We're a place she drives through to go get drugs and drive them back to Sawyer and sell them. Uh, and I think the court should consider either no contact with Minnesota or no contact with the Twin Cities if Minnesota is too const unconstitutionally broad. She has to be cut off from this cartel connection. It's the single most dangerous thing about her. No driving without a valid license must obtain a valid license. On um, the narcotic drugs, I'd recommend... Basically, on all the other non-felony counts, I'm going to recommend concurrent jail time. I was going to say six months for the narcotic drugs, 60 days for THC, 30 days for paraphernalia, 30 days for OER. For the felony bail jumps, uh, concurrent prison sentence, one and two out. The way I kind of structured my argument for this is I'm really using the D felony as the primary vehicle because it is all one course of conduct, all seven of these convictions. The D felony is the most serious. The others kind of happened at the same time. And I'm using them more to aggravate what the sentence should be for the D felony along with the other factors. I chose that 60% mark because there are factors that work well for her. Uh, it being on the low end of that 10 to 50 grams is a positive factor for her. Uh, her not having prior convictions for either simple possession drugs or for selling drugs are mitigating factors as well. I think the cartel connection factor and the fact that she's here without the benefit of acceptance of responsibility are aggravating. I think the cartel connection in particular 
is probably one of the most aggravating factors you could have on a possession with intent where someone hasn't died. I, I can't imagine a more aggravating factor than that. So I think that bumps it up to something where we're more towards like the middle end of that, that sort of sentencing paradigm for this offense. Um, that's the basis for my argument. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask you briefly to go over, I, just to tell me, you said 10 and 5 for the D, and just briefly go over, since there are so many um, other crimes, um, what exactly you were, you were asking, and I know you were essentially saying concurrent, but... Yep. On the narcotic drugs, six months county jail. On the THC, 60 days county jail. On the paraphernalia, 30 days county jail. On the OAR, 30 days county jail. On the felony bail jumps, one in, two out, both of them. All right. So essentially just to uh, have a sentence, but uh, you're using them, as you said, as with the aggravating, as an aggravating factor for the D felony, the intent. That's accurate. All right. Okay. Mr. Pollock. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, before I begin, um, I did submit with the court <clears throat> the dates that the Burnett County Jail provided to me that Ms. DeCora was in custody. I think they said March 1st, 2024 until June 5th, 2024. I have 97 days in that first stretch. And then a second arrest on July 16th, 2024, which has kept her in custody uh, for another 70 days up to today. I have 167 days total. All right. Stipulated? Yes. 167 days jail credit. Thank, um, you. thank you, Your Honor. I also uh, briefly had an opportunity to show this to Mr. Schmidt prior to the hearing. Um, Ms. DeCora's aunt, Ms. Kathleen Allen, provided the following statement. I am Vanessa DeCora's aunt. Vanessa is a very kind-hearted person. She's always helping everyone. Her mother, my sister, passed away two years ago, and she had custody of her great-grandchild since he was a baby. She's passed away from cancer, so I became legal guardian to Logan, who was Vanessa's grandchild. She's been helping me with Logan since I had him. Vanessa is the only person that can help me with him when I work. Please, can you take this into consideration during her sentencing? Thank you. I was not able to attend to today's hearing um, in support of Ms. DeCora, <clears throat> not because she didn't want to, but because she drives a school bus and this is right in the middle of the time when she has to work. So she was not able to attend. Um, I think Mr. Schmidt alluded to the cartel connections a great deal and the um, the concern that he has with that. And I think that's well-placed. I, I mean, he's right. You don't often hear people discussing connections to drug cartels. That said, I still think that this is a situation where probation and conditional jail can adequately protect the public. Um, essentially, the, I think, acknowledged problem here is Ms. DeCora associating with people who she should not be associating with. Uh, as the court stated, she does have some criminal history. I also, like Mr. Schmidt, came up with nine con uh, convictions, and I had the same list of convictions that he did, so I won't beleaguer that point but they are lower level, um, the sort of things that have kept her primarily off of supervision with the exception of the felony criminal damage to property that Mr. Schmidt alluded to. When you look at the um, DOC offender detail locator website, it indicates that she was revoked from supervision in October of 2023 and released on extended supervision on September of 2014. So she spent some time in custody and it appears successfully discharged from the extended supervision. I only see the one revocation note on the locator. Um, when I asked Ms. DeCora to kind of take me through this case and what happened, um, she said essentially, this is a situation where Four years ago or so, maybe five, she started falling in with the wrong crowd. She started um, getting involved in the drug scene. I think it, the, um, the video that was played at the trial indicated that she estimated she purchased drugs 100 times in the prior year. Uh, so she certainly has a rehabilitative need that can be addressed in that regard. 
Um, she is 45 years old. So I think to her credit, 45 years old with fairly minor criminal history up until now, this is the most certainly serious situation she has ever been involved in. Um, and if the court still believes that some period of incarceration is necessary to protect the public, I think an additional six months as a condition of uh, her probation, that would certainly create a lengthy time period away from the Sawyer County scene that she was in. Um, upon release, she advised that she would return to what she thinks of as the ideal situation for herself. Um, she's described to me her desire to return to um, the home with uh, her aunt, Miss Allen, who I read the statement from. She does help raise her grandchild, Logan Melton Jr. He is currently six years old and I bring him up um, not as a way to shield Miss Decora from uh, from the court, but rather just as, as a something that I think it's important to consider when discussing her desire to be released from custody when she was talking to uh, Deputy Mangan in the interview and continuing to provide information throughout my representation of her. She has stressed that uh, she has a six-year-old grandson who she needs to get home to. I certainly think that everyone can understand the desperation of someone who's trying to return to a six-year-old. That said, she was in a bad situation. The jury, as Mr. Schmidt stated, uh, did not find it, it, her story credible and convicted her of all seven counts. Um, with an additional six months in custody, she will be necessarily divorced from all of the people that uh, she was around. She will be in a period of enforced sobriety. And then when she is released uh, from custody on probation, the probation agent can certainly impose any conditions that they think is appropriate. From my perspective, I certainly agree with no contact with Roland Peterson, no contact with Jay Potak, no contact with any known drug dealers or associates. Um, and I think if she is kept away from those people, she has any number of skills and abilities that could ensure that she is not in a situation like this again. Uh, she's described to me two lengthy periods of employment. She worked as a home health care provider for her mother, as described uh, in the statement from Kathleen Allen. She worked uh, through Inclusa for approximately two years during the time when her mother was receiving cancer treatment. And then she described a period of seven years where she worked at the LCO Casino uh, and was able to maintain that job again for seven years. So a lengthy period of time and employment. She does believe she can get both of those jobs back um, if she is released. Uh, Mr. Schmidt alluded to his concern with the bond jumps. And uh, I think it's worth pointing out that Ms. Schmidt or Ms. Decora did have a bit of a rocky start on bond, although after posting the bond in June, she did report to Justice Point uh, as scheduled. I believe she provided a negative UA to them. She was in compliance with that uh, with her Justice Point supervision until her prior or, or her final arrest for the case that's now been dismissed and read in, which was, I think, a violation of no contact between her and Roland Peterson. She also attended court uh, court hearing here in Burnett County um, without you know, need of a warrant or any sort of absconding. Um, it, so unlike Mr. Schmidt, I do still feel that a probation is appropriate in this case. Um, and I'm essentially asking the court to withhold sentence in counts one, two, six, and seven, and place Ms. Decora on probation for a period of four years uh, with condition of six months of conditional jail time as I laid out. Uh, if the court does withhold sentence on um, those counts and Ms. Decora is revoked, the court has an extraordinary amount of time available to, uh, to incarcerate Ms. Decora. This is simply an opportunity for her to correct her issues in the community uh, through DOC. I think that she definitely has a rehabilitative need that can be addressed there. Um, 
this is a serious case, Your Honor, and I, th I think we, Ms. DeCora is certainly taking that very seriously as she sits here today, but given her relatively minor criminal history to date, as well as her real only opportunity on supervision being approximately a decade ago, she is a different person now than she was at 45 years old. I think even her age lends itself to um, the, the notion that the need to protect the public is lessened. I also am not sure of the status of Mr. Peterson's case, but last I knew he was still in custody, which I think will provide further assurance to the court that um, there will be protection to the public and the Ms. Bur uh, DeCora will not be traveling with Roland Peterson to the Twin Cities in the future. Uh, as to the remaining counts, I essentially concur with Mr. Schmidt. They are um, essentially part of this course of conduct. And uh, I was simply going to ask for court costs in each of those cases, though concurrent jail essentially to me is the same. But I, I view them as much as Mr. Schmidt did that the um, possession of uh, narcotic drugs, possession of THC and operating while revoked are sort of secondary concerns. And if the court feels that jail time is appropriate in those, I think that uh, the factors certainly weigh in favor of concurrent sentences. If the court is content, I was simply going to request that uh, the court uh, impose court costs to those cases and seize that from the bond previously posted. Um, Mr. Schmidt is likewise correct that uh, Ms. DeCora would not be eligible for the Challenge Incarceration Program at 45 years old. She is statutorily too old for that program. However, if the court does feel that a prison sentence is appropriate, I am requesting that um, Ms. DeCora be eligible for the Substance Abuse Program um, as soon as the Department of Corrections finds her suitable. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Cora, I'm now going to turn to you. This is your opportunity, your one and only chance to provide me any statement you wish, if you wish to do so. You do not have to if you don't wish to provide anything to me. Your only time to tell me anything about this case, anything about you, anything about your history, um, anything you would like me to consider before I decide uh, what to do with sentencing. I didn't prepare nothing. I didn't know what I was supposed to, if I was supposed don't to. don't have to prepare anything. You can speak from the heart if you mm -hmm. have something to say. Um, uh, here's the deal. I'm sure you've been sitting upstairs for a very long time thinking about, quite honestly, this every day. I'm mm -hmm. sure that this has been on your mind every single day. Mm -hmm. So while you're sitting up there in your bunk, what types of thoughts have went through your head? I'm sure there have been thoughts that you have been thinking, I want to make sure I tell the judge this. I want to make sure that the judge knows this. I want to make sure that I can state this or that my attorney says this. And I know that you're kind of put on the spot right now, but this is your time to let me know anything that you want me to consider before I sentence. Because here I have two vastly extremely different sentence requests and recommendations. One for a very high 10 years of initial confinement, five years of extended supervision sentence, and one with a probationary sentence. Two extremely different sentences. This is your time to tell me anything that you wish for me to know. If there's nothing, you can simply say, judge, I don't really have much to say. Um, just, uh, that I'm, um, Logan's caregiver. Um, when my mother passed away, um. Well, I'm going to tell you, that doesn't really hit my heart. You can go there. You can tell me it doesn't really hit my heart that you have to care for somebody. Everybody has to care some, for somebody. The cartel members have families. They have to care for somebody. That's not going to hit my heart. That's not going to make me go, okay, you shouldn't go to prison. It's just not. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell you, um, sorry for inconvenience in the court. It's not an inconvenience. This is justice. And this is a, uh, a crime was committed. There was a jury trial, you were convicted, and now you're here. Mm -hmm. So if you 
if you're sorry and, and you're remorseful. I'm, yeah. And um, just to um, say that I, I'm planning on being sober and doing what's right when I get out. Okay. Is there anything you want to say about what happened? Um, just that, that, you know, that it wasn't mine and, um, you know, just to be, I'm not going to, you know, make excuses about it, but, you know, it's, I was already, you know, found guilty for it. Well, this and is I, the and, first time you've ever said or that it's ever come out that it wasn't yours. Yeah. I mean, not, you've, this was not never anything that was shown in the videos to Deputy Mangan that it wasn't yours. Um, the only thing that was said was, hey, I can give you cartel connections. You never said this wasn't mine. This was so and so as I can lead you to this and that. That wasn't in the videos. Yeah. Right. No, that wasn't in the videos. So, yeah, the drugs weren't mine. So why is this the first time that we're hearing about that? I don't know. I thought just like by the non not guilty plea is. I just thought that that's what that explains. I don't know nothing about the court system or how it goes. Okay. All right. Well, this is a, a long way to day, and I, I know that this is a long way to day for you uh, since your jury trial. Um, we learned a lot about that day, and we learned a lot about you during that jury trial because we watched a lot of video. We watched a lot of video uh, with you and Deputy Mangan and your conversations with Deputy Mangan and your ins and your outs and your knowledge about the drug world and your connections, all of your connections, and that you have a lot of them. A lot of serious and scary connections, quite honestly. And none of that was true, Your Honor. Well, that's not what was said. And that's not what was trying to be depicted. I know. And that's not what was portrayed. Um, and so here today, today is the day of reckoning. It's the day where I hear the arguments from both sides. And it's the day that you get to hear the punishment, because that's what it is. And in looking at all of these things, this is usually in a sentencing, I get the arguments of the attorneys. Sometimes I get the information from the pre-sentence investigation report. If I order it, I get information from the preliminary hearings. I get information from any of the motions that are argued in front of me. In this case, I get the pleasure of having all of the information from the jury trial and hearing all of that and paying attention along with all of the 12 members of the jury and the alternate that was here, okay? And so I got to hear all of that information step by step by step along with the jury. I usually don't get to hear all of the evidence and the testimony and those things. So in looking at these cases, I get to, I, I'm here today to sentence and I need to determine the nature and the gravity of, of the offense. And then I have to look at you, Mr. Cora, and I need to look at your character, your past criminal record. I have to look at any needs for rehabilitation if you um, are in need of any types of services. I have to look at the public and needing to protect the public. And then I have to look at um, if there's what's called any undesirable behavior patterns. I have to look at your culpability, your age, your education, um, your history. I have to look at, as Mr. Schmidt brought up, if there is any remorse or if, there, if you're accepting um, responsibility, you're being accountable. And then I have to look at something else. It's called deterrence. There's something called specific deterrence where I'm looking at the defendant, you, Mr. Cora, and if in a sentence to specifically deter you from continuing in criminal behavior and general deterrence from deterring 
other people people generally from committing from committing crimes. And I have heard the arguments from the council and I heard the statement from your aunt and um, all of the testimony and information from the jury trial. You have been found guilty of possession with intent, less than 10, greater than 50 of uh, amphetamine slash methamphetamine, which is a very serious crime. And from all accounts, from everybody, from the state, from the defense, from you yourself in the videos at the jury trial, from all accounts throughout the duration of this, this case, at least until this very minute when you were put on the spot, there was the information about your connection with the cartel. Everybody had that same belief and same understanding. Um, and that came from you. That came from your words to the law enforcement, to your attorney, to the state, to the jury, to the court. That you yourself have a connection to the Mexican cartel and to the Asian cartel. Again, making it extremely serious. Because it doesn't only put you at risk. It doesn't only put your family at risk. It doesn't only put the community of Sawyer County at risk. It puts the community of the counties surrounding Sawyer County at risk. All of the counties that you are engaging in this criminal behavior and conduct at risk. So that makes it extremely serious. When I'm looking at all of the crimes that you are charged with, um, including the dismissed and red end felony bail jump. You could have a total of 48 and a half years of incarceration, 48 and a half years. You're 45 years old. That's essentially your life. You could spend essentially your life in prison, albeit not all of that is initial incarceration or incarceration inside of the prison. Um, some of that is outside of the prison, um, but extended supervision always has the ability to serve that in the prison if you're revoked. But 48 and a half years, that is a long time, Ms. Decora, a lot of time to have, which could be potentially hanging over your head. That felony bail is dismissed and read in. So that's, oh no, it's not 40. It's not 48. I, yeah, it's, it is. Add six years, 48. So it's just 48 years hanging over your head. So just 48, not a half, just 48 years hanging over your head. So that felony bail, so that six years is off. So we're just talking 42 years. So I'm looking at, I have a possibility of 42 years total to be able to come up with a sentence for you. Now this is serious, but is it that serious? Is this a maximum possible penalty, everything to be consecutive, or is this somewhere in between? Or is this a probation case? This is where I have to look at the arguments and I have to look at you and I have to determine exactly what, what this is. The seriousness of the case is where the court is going to focus the most on. I have to turn to Mr. Pollock's argument first because he is arguing for probation. He is saying Mr. Cora is a good human. She has a good heart. She does things for people. And that's coming through from the, the statement from your aunt that you're always giving to people and you're doing good things. Mr. Cora, I don't doubt that. You come across as a person who cares, and especially for your six-year-old grandchild, you care a lot. But I think there's two sides of you as well, because you are also engaged in serious criminal activity. But I'm looking at this probation, and I do need to first consider probation, all right? 
my higher courts tell me I need to first consider probation unless confinement is necessary to protect the public from further criminal activity. All right. Unless you need correctional treatment or you need a uh, treatment that only a correctional um, facility can provide. Or if I put you on probation and it would unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense. Now we're talking about possession with intent of methamphetamine. And we're talking about greater than 10 grams, less than 50. And we're talking about about 15 or so grams. That's a lot of methamphetamine. It's not a significant amount. It's not an enormous amount, but it's a lot of methamphetamine. But we're also talking about, as everybody's saying, and both sides are arguing that this is serious because it does involve the cartel. And I believe that you do have connections. I do, because it was stated adamantly numerous times, various times throughout by yourself. This is the first time here today that you're saying, I lied. I made it up. I just thought I would just make it up. So if the court were to place you on probation, it would unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense because this is that serious. And if I were to put you on probation, I wouldn't be protecting the public because I can't guarantee that if, if you were to be released that you wouldn't start engaging in additional criminal conduct because you were placed on bail in Sawyer County for possession of narcotic drugs. And very shortly after, I can't say immediately, but very shortly after you were placed in additional criminal conduct because you were placed on bail in Sawyer County for possession of narcotic drugs. And very shortly after, I can't say immediately, but very shortly after you were placed on bail is when you came and drove through Burnett County and you were caught by the police and were charged with these charges. All right. And so, and these are very serious, more serious than your possession of narcotic drug, drug allegations in Sawyer County. So you're already on bail. You already had conditions and yet you continue to engage in criminal conduct. So that's not giving me assurance that you're not going to stop. And it's not giving me assurance that you're not going to go back to the cartel and you're not going to continue to engage in that activity. All right. Um, I've not heard anything again, other than today about, well, it's not mine. It wasn't mine. I thought by pleading guilty, it just said it wasn't mine. But again, I watched those videos, the very lengthy videos, the multiple questions back and forth and answers from you and Deputy Mangan back and forth and you providing a lot of information to him. Not once do you say, it's not mine, it's so-and-so's. I'll give you information about so-and-so. Not once did you say those things. Not once did you say anything, but I'll lead you to the cartel. I'll give you that, I'll lead you to the cartel. This was the first time I've heard, it's not mine, I lied about the cartel. You don't have an, a very lengthy criminal history. It's not very serious. For whatever reason, the last few years, something happened. Even with raising your six-year-old grandson, something happened that made you or didn't make you, you make your own choices that led you down this path. What was it, Ms. Decora? Roland Peterson. Roland Peterson led you down this path. I was in the same vehicle with him every time something happened. And that's my, uh, what is that called? Um, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then why be with Roland Peterson? I didn't know that he had drugs in the car. 
on no. the on the times this happened, and I never had them on. They were never on me. They were they were his, and I asked for the fingerprints and DNA for the. How many times did this happen? Um, two times, three times. How many yeah. times was this? Um, this is the third time. Third time. So then you knew not to ride with Roland Peterson, right? If it happened two other times, then you knew not to ride with Roland Peterson, right? This is, yeah. I, 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 when I was out on bail, I was in a different vehicle. And this last time, but my daughter, she started bleeding and that, um, my ride, I went to go pick up another car. Uh, Mr. Cor, I'm stopping you right there. All I'm hearing is excuses. I know. Your excuses, excuses. I'm not trying to make excuses. And I'm hearing Roland Peterson. This is the first time you're saying this is Roland Peterson's. First time I'm hearing ever. I've never heard that in the video. I didn't hear it in anything. First time you're saying it was Roland Peterson's. Okay. And you're shaking your head up and down. Yes. Yes. This is the first time at all you're ever saying that this is Roland, Roland Peterson's. Yes. This is the first time that you're saying anything about the drugs. You're 45 years old. It's about time you grow up, you figure it out, you be a mom, you be a grandmother, and you don't engage in this kind of criminal activity. You don't do this. I agree. Because otherwise you are going to raise your grandson in prison until he's 18. And I'm sure this is not what you want. No, your honor. And the problem here is I am not seeing, I am, I'm seeing finger pointing. I'm seeing um, now retraction of uh, statements. I'm seeing um, no remorse. I'm not seeing any accountability. I'm all I'm seeing is uh, the fact that I have a serious case and a jury of your peers that have found you guilty on all 12 counts or all seven counts. And I have two very serious or very differing, um, very differing sentencing recommendations. This is a prison sentence for sure. So the court has to determine how long the prison sentence should be. This was a significant amount of, of drugs. Um, 15 grams of methamphetamine. I have nobody, uh, no, no admission, no remorse, uh, finger pointing. I have the cartel involved, at least by admission, uh, multiple times through a video. Even if that was used to try for self-preservation, um, at no time was that retracted and uh, stated to the officer that it was used to try and uh, self-preserve and uh, get a deal. With regards to count one, possession with intent, amphetamine, methamphetamine, a D felony, the court is going to sentence you to eight years of initial confinement, five years of extended supervision. With regards to count two, possession of narcotic drugs, one year of initial confinement, two years of extended supervision, concurrent to count one. Count three, possession of THC, six months of jail, concurrent to all counts. Count four, operating while revoked, six months, jail, concurrent to all counts. Count five, possession of drug paraphernalia, 30 days, jail, concurrent to all counts. Count six and seven, one year initial confinement, two years of extended supervision, concurrent, or uh, yeah, concurrent to all counts. Any lesser uh, sentence would unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offenses uh, that have been uh, committed. Conditions of probation, no contact with Jay Potek, 
Roland Peterson, any known drug dealers, any known drug users, anyone on felony bond or felony bail, anyone on felony probation or extended supervision. Absolute sobriety, no use or possession of any illegal drugs, substances or paraphernalia. No alcohol, no casinos, no establishments that have the primary purpose for the sale or the service of alcohol. Regular drug testing. Gainful employment. Thinking for a change or breaking barriers. An AODA assessment and follow through. not eligible for the challenge incarceration program. Not eligible for substance abuse program until has sat five years, but she won't be eligible until she's sat that anyway. She needs 36 months left on her sentence. to fines and fees, $518 for the first felony, $518 for the second felony, $518 for the third felony, $396 for the, sec or for the fourth felony, $200 per misdemeanor for a total of $2,500. The amount of bail you have posted. You have 20 days to appeal. Should you fail to appeal within 20 days, you do lose that right. No voting in any election until your civil rights are restored. No firearm uh, for life. One hundred and sixty seven days of jail credit. Mr. Schmidt, what is the court missing? I didn't catch anything. Mr. Pollock? Um, Your Honor, I, I don't think you missed anything. <clears throat> Can you spell Potec, please? P O T A C K. And J, I think, is just J A Y. Thank you. If there's nothing further, then we are adjourned.